Welcome to the Bear Marriage Podcast. I'm Sheila Ray Gregoire from BearMarriage.com, where we like to talk about healthy, evidence-based biblical advice for your sex life and your marriage. I am joined right now by my daughter, Rebecca Lindenbach. Hello, hello. And last week, we had a great interview with Philip Payne, who is the author of an upcoming book called The Bible Versus Biblical Womanhood. He's written so much on what the Bible says about women. And he's just a really, really smart academic and theologian. And we have the second half of his interview coming up in just a minute. But before we get to it, I have a super big announcement. Are you ready? Dun, da, da, da. <laughs> Our Fixed It For You book is here. Yay! Yay! So for those of you who Woo-hoo! follow me on Instagram, on Facebook, you know that every now and then I put up these little Fixed It For You quotes, mm-hmm. where I quote something horrendous that an author or a pastor or a Bible teacher has said. Yes. And then I cross out some of the horrendous bits and I change it so that the quote now points to something that Jesus would say. Exactly. (laughs) And we have created a new fixed it for you book. There are 30 of them, 10 of which have never been seen before, never Mm -hmm. on social media. And the purpose of it is discussion. Yeah. So it's filled with um, each each little fixed it for you has six questions that you can use with your spouse, Mm -hmm. with your friends for a small group curriculum. (laughs) And it's just such a fun way of talking through these issues. So I'm going to have links to that book. We're going to be bringing on Gina Tiende to talk a little bit about why we did that later in the podcast. So Mm -hmm. we wanted to let you know the fixed it for you book is here. Um, Go check it out. Link in the podcast notes. And now let's bring on Philip Payne again. Okay, I have to get your take on a particular verse. Um, Because this is this is something that we run into quite a bit in some of the work that we do is the first Peter three passage being used to tell women that they must be silent with their husbands win them without words. So if they have a problem in marriage, they should not speak up and how women are the weaker vessel and just used very poorly, I think. But you make a very interesting case that 1 Peter 3, 7 actually tells husbands to submit to their wives. I do. And so I would why. love to hear that. Uh, I'll tell you why. In, in Greek, there's a convention that you can set up a pattern and you use the word similarly. So, and and then in those cases, the similarly implies adding the missing verb. So for instance, in 1 Timothy chapter three, you have overseers must be, and then it gets the qualifications. Mm-hmm. And then verse eight says, deacon similarly, and mm-hmm. it doesn't repeat the verb must be. Mm-hmm. Uh, it says deacon similarly, and then gives four qualifications. One, two, three, four. Now, interestingly, in verse 11, he says, the women deacons similarly must be. And he lists the same four qualifications in the same order. Slightly different wording, but mm-hmm. uh, the same order of the same qualifications. In both cases, the word similarly implies Similarly, deacons must be. Similarly, deacons who are women must be. Mm -hmm. Now, here in 1 Peter, we have a series of imperatives uh, to submit. 1 Peter 2.13, submit to the governmental authorities. First, then verse 18, again, you have uh, the submit to this. 1 Peter 3.1. Submit. Verse Peter 3 7. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands. And then it appears that's in verse 1. Verse 7. Husbands, in the same way. And it doesn't repeat the verb, but it doesn't have to because he's just given a series of three submit, submit, submit imperatives. Mm -hmm. Husbands, in the same way. To your own wives, submit to your own wives, dwelling together wisely, recognizing her as a weaker feminine precious vessel, and assign them the honor they deserve as co-heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, 
so that your prayers will not be hindered. <laughs> so you have this co-heir, which this is a financial term, someone who inherits the property. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in the context of women being affirmed as co-heirs, and by the way, heir is, is a, it's an authority term. Right. And I want to make a little aside here because I think it's really important. <clears throat> when Paul talks, he almost never, and I think he never says, these your rights. He's mm -hmm. not focused on rights. These are my rights and my power. Uh, he's not telling that overseers have intrinsic power. Uh, mm -hmm. He's not saying that we should focus on rights. But when someone is oppressing another group and mm -hmm. taking away their rights, he's like a Rottweiler. <laughs> <laughs> he goes after them uh, and yeah. defends their rights. So mm -hmm. just because Paul does not talk a lot about claim your rights, uh, it doesn't mean that Paul is not concerned about rights. Mm -hmm. He will defend those rights. But, but the, when, what, the vision Paul has for leadership is a servant leadership. That's why the, the deacon is called a deacon, because that's, a, that's the word for servant. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, yes, Phoebe was a servant of the church. And it was, it was a humble position of the servant that Jesus took in washing the feet of the disciples. And he says, you should not be like the Gentiles mm -hmm. whose leaders lorded over them. Yes. Rather, you should be a servant. I, I heard someone say, state that because some egalitarians talk about rights, they're mm -hmm. not being biblical. Uh, mm -hmm. Because this equality and having equal rights, that's not biblical. Well, it's true that the leadership should have a servant humble attitude and the focus is not on my rights but it's not because rights aren't important and it's not because we should uh, let other people take away other people's rights uh, it's because our model should be christ and servant-like mm -hmm. and in this case when he calls husbands to submit to their wives it's the same call he's making to all believers submit to one another. Uh, in marriages thrive when the partners want to make the other happy. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they listen to the partner. They submit to the other desires. And when they're both submitting, say, no, 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 this is better for you. Well, they love each other. And mm -hmm. it nurtures relationships when someone comes into a relationship and says, I am the head of the house. You must do what I say. That is not nurturing uh, a, a relationship. It's undermining mm -hmm. the relationship. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important. Absolutely. I think, I think, it's, I think it's, you see, just like, now it's interesting that the passage in 1 Peter 3, read the part before about caring for one another and a confronting one another so that there's this interaction where there's uh, mutual involvement caring developing putting oneself at the service of others that is the context for this relationship husbands and wives mm -hmm. in, in that context it's not odd that paul would say wives submit your husbands and then similarly husbands submit to your wives mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up, but I, I, I do want to mention just a few other things about your book, uh, just so that people know. So I haven't asked much about the Gospels, just because those don't tend to be the passages that people use to try to limit women. But you do go into a lot of detail on how the way Jesus treated women should inform how we see women. So I really appreciated those sections of the book. I wish I could have gotten into the story about how you actually influenced the NIV to change their translation of First Timothy 2. That's an amazing story. And so everybody go get the Bible versus biblical womanhood. I think you can pre-order it now. Um, but 
Philip Payne is a big deal. I am really honored that you have been on our podcast because you've done so much work on this over your life. And you are such a respected scholar to the extent that the NIV committee actually did change um, how they how they translated First Timothy 2.12. So we really, I really appreciate that. Um, I do want to throw this last question out at you. And we only have about three minutes, so I <laughs> have to be quick. But how do you personally handle it when so many people accuse you of not being biblical and of not following God, but of just using your bias to look at the Bible because you're not listening to the pure reading of scripture. I hear that all the time. And I'm just curious, like, does that affect, like, how does that affect you? How do you, how do you not let that get to you? Well, I, I say, if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love that. He was criticized plenty. And mm-hmm. because I began where most of those critics are coming from, and because I was in that position myself, I, I understand it. I understand what it's like when you've grown up in an environment and you've heard something and you thought that that was the truth. Uh, that's why I almost stood up and said, that's not true. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, because I've been there and I've done the same thing myself, I can't really criticize them <laughs> for going through the same path. I feel like when Paul says that uh, I was a man of hubris, and I was persecuting the church. Well, uh, when he got persecuted by these Jewish authorities, he had done the same thing and worse. Mm -hmm. And so um, I guess I can be sympathetic, but I'm encouraged because every complementarian who has criticized me in print Mm -hmm. has changed their own view regarding some of the things that I taught. So for mm-hmm. instance, Thomas Schreiner, uh, he, he wrote a blistering critique of my work um, and it was really unfair. 81 times he said, Payne teaches this when I didn't teach that. Mm-hmm. 10 times he said, I teach something when I taught the opposite. But on 10 other issues, he said, Payne is right that calling an overseer a man of one woman does not really exclude women. Mm -hmm. That's a huge acknowledgement. So so even when people have unfairly uh, criticized, by the way, you can see my critique of Shriners on my (laughs) pain.com, this is there. But every time uh, someone has read my work, uh, they have been changed, whether it's complementarian, or egalitarian. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. I want to encourage people to read your work. So the Bible versus biblical womanhood is available for pre-order right now. I will put a link in the podcast notes, but you've got a few other books too. Um, Mutual by Design is a yes. marriage book. Yes. The, the Mutual by Design is um, a Christians for Biblical Equality published book about marriage. And mm-hmm. I have uh, the concluding concluding section about what about headship, mm-hmm. and it talks about the meaning of head, its use in in Greek literature. To me, uh, the septuagintal use, the the Greek Old Testament translation, uh, proves that the meaning person authority over was not native to Greek. Yes. Uh, yeah. Almost, Interesting when you look at Roche. Is it Roche? Is that well, we won't get well, into Roche all that. Roche is the Hebrew word. And yes. 180 times in the Hebrew scriptures, it means the heads of the tribes of Israel or the leader. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the Septuagint only translates one of those 180 with the word head. Yes. Uh, uh, clearly. And the, Septu- Septu- the Septuagint is, is the Greek translation that was pop that was around when jesus was around of the old testament so yeah so So, when they were translating the hebrew into greek when there was a hebrew word meaning 
head of the tribes, they didn't use the Greek word that we use for head of a wife. So very interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's huge because it shows that they didn't feel comfortable doing that. And mm-hmm. in a few cases where they did, there's only one case where they clearly use it as the metaphor. There are other cases where they add as head. Right. Kepelin, as so you've head. got some mutual by design and you've also got a few others. I will put links in the podcast notes. Um, yeah. And, and, I will also put links. I, I found you on Twitter. I've been following, you have amazing Twitter threads and where you go into a lot of these details. I think they're amazing. I will put a link to your Twitter profile as well and to your website. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. This has been really, really informative. And I hope that it opens people's eyes to the fact that we are to be mutual by design and that this, the, the gospel does depend on, on seeing us as co-heirs with Christ. I love that. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Philip. <laughs> I appreciate Philip spending his time with us. I really, really enjoyed my interview with him. Um, I learned so much. His book is Awesome Bible versus Biblical Womanhood. So uh, please check that out. You can pre-order it now. And it's just really well done. Mm-hmm. And it's very accessible, very easy to understand. But we need to start getting this stuff right. Because yes. there's been so much wrong stuff written about the Bible and women and marriage. And it's been hurting people. Yeah. It really has. And we need, that's what our Fixed It For You book is for, is to help stop this narrative. So check that out too. And to further that conversation, I want to bring someone else on this podcast who has also been walking this road of having to fix things. Well, we are so pleased to bring on the Bear Marriage Podcast, our dear friend, Ingina Ochande. Did I say that right, Ingina? Yes, you did. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) you did. And we go way back. I, I know you were following me and I was following you at Intentional Today, your blog, like, I don't know, a decade ago. A yes, long, a is. long time a ago. A long time ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. we have both morphed and we've both changed over the last few years. And uh, we're in a community online with a bunch of other advocates. And we just have a great time there. And we really enjoy you. And you're on you're on this journey with us. And so we thought that we could have a chat with you about what it means to fix things. Um, both things that other people have said, but also things that you have said. So do you want to just tell us a little bit about your blog and your journey over the last few years? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's just been a blast getting to know you. Like for, you mentioned that we've known each other for a long time. So I first got introduced to you, Sheila, at, you know, at Love Orna in Vacuum um, when I was a newlywed myself. I'll be married now. This year will be like 15 years. And then when I was a newlywed, when I was leaving, because my husband and I are Kenyans, we're Kenyan Americans, we born, raised, brought up in Kenya. So I was in Kenya when I found your blog as a newlywed (laughs) wife. I think I'd been married like a year or so back then. Um, And we were having problems, you know, (laughs) marriage, uh, growth related problems between two, um, you know, honoring spouses. And I was just looking for help. And I think I found your blog through another blogger who gave a link to your blog. And you're talking about boundaries and things like that. And that just shifted everything for me. Because mm-hmm. what we needed in our marriage is boundaries. <laughs> we desperately needed boundaries. And we needed to know where does one person begin? Where does the other end? So that is how I got connected to you. And then like two years later, we moved to the United States and we connected. Now here we, mm-hmm. we started talking and, and all that. So that's been that's been awesome. So I've been just, you know, the last, um, been blogging since 2009, but seriously, uh, 2011, 12. And I was just talking about regular marriage issues, um, just like most marriage bloggers. And then um, a couple of things have happened over the years, uh, specifically like from 2017, I fell sick. Um, so went through years of suffering <laughs> mm-hmm. and there wasn't like quick answers that like anybody who has had ever like had a chronic uh, issue in their body is like you, you're, and you may be evangelical conservative Christian and you're wondering how, where is God? You kind of have this idea of who God is mm-hmm. until pain and suffering uh, begin to like, okay, what I know about God is kind of not panning out to my reality. Um, So that was just one of the things that happened. My personal journey with uh, chronic um, 
uh, chronic pain and and then having close friends of my close friends of friends of ours who are in terrible terrible marriages but from the surface they look like normal marriage issues but they were not you know um and then they you know the the challenges of 2020 specifically uh what happened to George Floyd the murder of George Floyd and just the light bulb went off for me mm-hmm. went on for me mm-hmm. it was like oh so this is what these women who I coach who are in person in my personal life they keep you know because there was this place where uh people of color are saying this has been our experience this has been an experience living as a black person as a person of color and everybody else who doesn't go through that is like what 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 <laughs> you know it's a long time ago like come on you know so there are these women in this terrible terrible marriages are saying this is my experience and we are looking on from the outside looking in and saying what what this is normal i mean come on pray more have more sex and you know? <laughs> and suddenly <laughs> the dissonance made sense to me because i was walking through that personal suffering uh walking with close friends of mine in terrible marriages uh, and 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 just the whole racism uh, season of that just coming out to light and people just being more receptive because they saw something on TV and suddenly I was like oh my goodness you know so just things just became to a head in 2021 at the beginning 2022 at the beginning and just the shift had to be made um so that's where my shift happened took down my books and stopped coaching because I needed to get my health together personal health as well as my (laughs) the kind of help that I put out needed to get healthy um and so that's the journey I've been on the last couple of uh, months since well the last year really um and the biggest thing was as well as uh the great sex sex, uh, rescue the statistics that came out and I was like, okay, <laughs> so <laughs> this is not just my feeling. It's not just the other women saying this. It is actually, here is the proof that mm-hmm. this is the truth. You know, there are things that are said, the things that I've said, things that we are taught are proving harmful to women. And, 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 and suddenly, you know, everything just coming together. And I guess that has been my frustration as well. It's like, what, uh, well, my frustration with like we have everything as the church like we have the the research has been done women are in the church like we have so much that has should be shifting our perspective but and it is doing some in 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 some places but majorly it has been uh like no (laughs) we don't really believe you all (laughs) you know I know yeah yeah that's exactly it. And I love what you're saying. Like the, the, the everything has been put into place that the shift should be happening. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I've been really kind of mo- meditating on that and trying to figure that out myself as well. And really what I just keep coming back to is, is I think that we're in this, this time period where the church is really going to be separated to those who have ears to hear those who have eyes to see. And mm-hmm. at some point people have to recognize it's in front of you. If you have eyes to see, you have no choice. You must see. If you close your eyes, mm-hmm. you're doing that mm-hmm. you at this there. point. There's too much evidence. Yes. There's too much evidence. But I think as Ingina's story tells us, sometimes it takes a couple of years, even though the evidence is before you. Sometimes it, it sometimes mm-hmm. it takes a couple of years yeah. and or however long it is for different people. And I know I, I know the Fixed It For You's that, is, that are launching this week, that book, uh, the Fixed It For You devotional. I told you all about it earlier. I'll tell you more about it later. Um, But it's a great discussion guide that can start some of these conversations because sometimes you just need a visual nugget, Mm -hmm. (laughs) something which is just so horrendously bad. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. we're going to show you what what it it really looks like. And I know, Angina, you, I I love, what I love is when people take this idea, which wasn't even ours. We got it from someone else. Yeah, it was the Australian or New Zealand? Jane Borman, Australian. Australian, yeah, she's a journalist who would quote unquote fix um, headlines that would be like, you know, woman raped at age 15, man rapes 15 year old child, right? Like oh, wow. she would change them yes. um, so that it was, so that the, the, the onus was actually on the right person. And so instead of yeah. using mm-hmm. euphemistic language and we're trying to, and you're trying to do the same thing. And I mean, yeah. we say you, but you, everyone should see the text threads. Oh yes. It's amazing between Joanna, me and my mom. Every time I do a for, for you, is this one good? No, don't do that. But, <laughs> but you're doing a bunch of them too. So 
So I love yes. this. Like, like let's all jump on the fixed it for you bandwagon. So mm-hmm. I will, I will put, 100%. I will put some Mangina's fixed it for you in the podcast notes. For those of you listening on YouTube, Katie's going to put one up on the screen right now. <laughs> so, so you've been fixing things as well. Um, just to show that, Hey, there are other ways of seeing this. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. What do you think it takes to give people ears to hear? Or maybe, I mean, I know that we can't make people see and make people hear. But I guess the but question would be like, what are the, what are the here's, catalysts? Here's the yeah. Like, cause we can't, we know we don't all have ears to hear. We don't all have eyes to see. Like that's why Jesus says those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Right. Mm-hmm. But the question is how can we recognize people who do versus those who don't? Cause yeah. there's always going to be a people around yeah. us who have hardened hearts but how can we as the Mm -hmm. consumers Mm -hmm. of this media as the people Mm -hmm. who are recommending Mm -hmm. the bible studies like what is what i guess what we want to figure out together is like what is reasonable to expect Mm -hmm. from teachers because instant Mm -hmm. perfection is not no but what is reasonable before Mm -hmm. they lose all trust or credibility Mm -hmm. i guess that's what we we're we're, we really want to work that out a little bit yeah because when this when that must have been a horrific decision to take down Mm -hmm. all of your books and blog posts it was it was (laughs) i but before then i wasn't kind of sleeping well um and i remember i actually because I mean, so much was, I like, there was so much on me, including like my body was just kind of breaking down due to, so there was just so much piling on my plate. Uh, but I remember I actually took down the books like almost at midnight because we were just hanging out with my husband and I'm like, I got to do it. I I can't do this anymore. I have to, because uh, I not only took out the, the books and the courses, I deleted like immediately over 200 blog posts and I've continued to delete more and probably a hundred more. Uh, so I was like up hours just <laughs> clicking, <laughs> clicking, clicking, cleaning out as much as I could. Uh, uh, and um, it was, it was, it, it was hard and, and on me. And then also on my audience who are used to, I'm sure Sheila, you went through that. People mm-hmm. who are used to hearing a certain marriage teaching, and then they feel like you took out the rug from under them. So that was my experience. So the messages, uh, you mm-hmm. know, that the friendly fire was the hardest um, mm-hmm. people in the, in our space um, just really worried and concerned and they, they might not know, uh, but <laughs> you know, they, they might not know that some things were not super encouraging because mm-hmm. you're trying to hear from God and you're trying to do the right thing. And just that you just feel like you're getting pulled back and it's, it, it was, just, it, it was, I, I do appreciate people who just checked in and called and did all that, but so the friendly fire was the hardest, um, uh, yeah. especially when it was direct, like you're way offline, you know, <laughs> things like that. So uh, so it was hard. It, it was hard. But at the same time, it's like you're making these shifts. And the for me, the biggest thing was I one of the biggest one of the very encouraging things was I was literally following there was somebody who had gone ahead of me like I could watch you. Um, I, you, you and the team had done the research and you had pivoted and I had watched you a couple, like it had been like maybe two years or something since Mm -hmm. every, you've always been vocal in, in standing with truth for sure, but you, (laughs) some things began to (laughs) shift Mm -hmm. and that's how I discovered you in Kenya because I was looking for truth, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so when things just changed radically, so uh, basically I, I was not alone. That's, that's the thing that the yes, it was a revolving door. Some people were leaving, others were coming in, but those that were coming in was such an encouragement. And the people who had gone ahead of me, uh, like you, and then there was the advocates, uh, Sarah McDougall, Natalie, mm-hmm. um, you know, Julie, there were just so many people that I had already been reading. And of course now there are the women for me, that was the biggest thing is like, y'all don't know the people that I know, you know, the people who are like, oh, things are not as bad. I'm like, you have no idea. (laughs) (laughs) Just make the assumption that you woke up and just decided to change, you know? (laughs) They do not know the personal, the horror, the, the things that you have witnessed that are driving you. It's not just head knowledge. 
Mm-hmm. And to your, and to your, and to your uh, I mean, I think you put out the question earlier, that, like, what then? It takes years, it takes time to kind of make the shift. But what is that thing that causes people to make a shift? And I think for me, I think I was reading uh, Christine, Chris Mayfield's book, Attached yes. to God. Yes. And there's something that I, yeah, yeah, I really resonated because he said that it takes kind of like experiential, it takes experience and a connection to your feelings, basically empathy for yourself or others to, to begin, like you cannot just, it's hard to make a change from head knowledge only. It's mm-hmm. hard to make a change from, unless you're the kind of person who can connect to other people's experiences, which means you need to be able to connect with your own experiences as well. But if you're the kind of person who's stuffing things down in your own life, it's very hard to connect with the suffering of others. So for me, it was like, I, I was going through these hard, hard times on a personal level. So it was kind of like, okay, what's, it kind of kind of softens your heart about what, are the, what, are, what other people are going through. But as well as you begin to get this knowledge, you know, the, the research and, and, and just the people around your life and things connect. So I think, I think some people, to be honest, and we were talking about this with my husband because he's a logic guy. He's very <laughs> much of a logic, logic centered person. So it was like, yeah, we're talking about that. It was like, it is hard. And he's going through all that attachment styles and all that to figure out something. So it is it, it's like, it's very hard to connect emotionally to the experience of others when you're not connecting to your experience mm-hmm. with yourself. So you mm-hmm. tend to look at other things with pure logic. This is theology. Mm-hmm. This is what the gods, God, God says. And so regardless of how you feel, this is where you should be aiming at. So it gets, becomes very hard to make a shift because mm-hmm. you're set and you're stuck. You know, this is really interesting because Becky Castle Miller on a podcast last month was talking about emotions and how so often in the church, we see emotions as a negative thing. And there have actually been blog posts by, I don't know if it was the gospel coalition or desiring God. I think it was the gospel coalition about how empathy is a sin. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember um, that. Yeah. Yeah. It really, really, really awful stuff about how we're, we're just supposed to approach things with logic. And yet, like you're saying, unless you're able to connect emotionally, logic alone doesn't move us. Like it's emotion that often moves these really important changes. And I just wonder how, um, yeah. Oh, it's desiring yes, God. I just, I just Googled it. You want to make sure yes. Yeah. <laughs> desiring God put out an article saying the enticing sin of empathy. Yes. I so, so not only is it a sin, you might be tempted to be an, a decent human being yes. who's empathetic, but don't yes. give in. Don't no give matter in. how enticing yeah. it is to be empathetic. Don't give in. Oh because, my goodness. Because yeah. as soon as we try to be empathetic, it means that we are, we are willing to, to allow someone else's pain to touch us. Mm-hmm. And when you start to do that, when you allow people's pain to touch you, it is very, very difficult to remain a bystander. It is. And that's what we saw Mm -hmm. Jesus modeling to us so much. And Mm -hmm. I think that's the part of Jesus that, in my opinion, really scares a lot of these guys. Uh, I think this is why we don't hear about the actual life of Christ in a lot of these books. Mm -hmm. We hear a lot about the death Mm -hmm. of Christ. Hear a lot about the death of Christ. We don't hear about the life of Christ. You know, Christ did a lot of, he did a lot of weeping. He did a lot of uh, just being around friends. He Mm -hmm. talked to people, he fed people, he met their needs. He actually like did a lot of stuff that actually made people's lives better because he saw their pain and he reacted. Mm -hmm. And, and it's not surprising to me that in a lot of these books, a lot of these sermons, a lot of these places you hear about Christ's death. And then you hear about the instructions to the churches. Mm-hmm. We don't hear a lot about Christ's mm-hmm. example. Yeah. And I, when I look at the people who have made shifts, I just see a lot of discussion about, you know, what would, like, this isn't of Jesus, you know, mm-hmm. like, like we can say, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. I can find you an old Testament verse, or I can mm-hmm. find you one verse in one of Paul's letters that rationalizes what I am doing, but I can't. Yeah rationalize it when I'm comparing it to the example of Christ. Mm -hmm. So if our Mm -hmm. faith requires that we don't sit and weep with people who are being harmed, whether they're being murdered or abused or, you Mm -hmm. know, or even just, or even just 
told that they don't matter as much as someone yeah, else. Even just yes. carrying unnecessary yeah. shame or something. Mm-hmm. You know, when someone is hurting and instead of us sitting and weeping with them, mm-hmm. we just tell them, well, mm-hmm. this is why you should be grateful anyway. This is why you should always see, see, yeah. like you should always rejoice in everything, rejoice. See, you should give thanks in everything. See, with everything by yeah. prayer and petition, request, uh, bring your requests to God. We just hit them with a Bible verse instead of actually entering yeah. into their experience. And that yeah. stops us from ever being able to get close enough to someone to allow them to change us. We're really comfortable yeah. in the evangelical church, giving orders from on high. We're yeah. not as comfortable yeah. of doing what Christ did and actually getting down and washing the feet because washing the feet means you actually have to look up at what the person is. Mm-hmm. You can't just bark mm-hmm. orders far away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 I, I, I like that Rebecca, because I, it's, Literally, people are comfortable, and I come from the conservative, um, evangelical conservative Christianity molded with a Kenyan culture, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, so it's 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 so easy, like to bark orders, but also it's it's like people don't want to model their life after Christ. It's like we have this whole book that we throw at people. And when, when you start talking about like, who was Christ really? That's why people are very comfortable talking about, we need to follow the Bible. We need to have a Bible-centered life. We need the Bible, blah, blah, blah. but start talking about a Christ-centered life. Like who is Jesus? What did he do? He said, like, how was his day? How was his interactions? Because for me, it came, the reality when the light went on is like, oh, wait a minute. Like Jesus is God with us. It's like God said, okay, I'm, I'm coming. I'm going to show you who I am versus who millennia people have told you I am because all the, all the filters have been coming through human beings, you know, the, the Middle Eastern culture, you know, everything has been, but you know, God said, I'm, I'm coming as in from the time he said, I will come flesh and blood and I will show you who I am. Mm-hmm. Then it won't be so hard to connect who I am versus what the word of God says or what things is like, okay, now look at me. This is who I am. This is how I love. This is how I treat people. This is how I do my day. Now shape your life after me. Mm-hmm. But, you know, everybody still wants to go through. It's like, let's keep the Emmanuel, God with us and talk about him. It's kind of like how people will talk about you in a room and you're like, hey, I'm here. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> and I feel like sometimes, you know, this somebody might think this is Harrison, but it's like, God is like, hey, I, are you talking about me? I'm here, <laughs> you know, because mm-hmm. that's what we throw at women, at people in terrible situations, but also generally, even as Rebecca was saying, in marriage, it, it or as was it you, Sheila, you're saying it doesn't even have to be these horrific situations. It can be just general marriage issues where we are putting the pressure or the burden on the wife to be the mature one. But mm-hmm. kind of like me and my husband at the beginning, where there was like an imbalance of like who is doing what. And all we needed was like, okay, this is the baseline of marriage. This is how, and then the moment you identify the baselines, it's like everybody owns up to their stuff because they actually do love their spouse. You know, Mm -hmm. they're not, they're not operating from like a pattern of, of abuse or destruction or addictions. They just were taught bad. And now they, once they see the truth, they accept it. So, but if we don't talk about these truths, like I've had so many women since I did the shift, they're like, oh my goodness, I have been carrying so much weight and my husband is a great guy, but we literally operate like, we just do the old African thing or the old American thing of like the wife is the burden bearer, the husband is the provider, he makes decisions, but something is missing. You know, the wife is feeling the pressure. So like teachings, like what you teach and- even when people begin to like myself and other advocates begin to say, okay, this is abusive. This is kind of normal. And this is abusive. So the women are like, okay, I know what to work on. And the good hearted guys begin to like, okay, because I love my wife. I love my family. I'm going to pull up my socks and just be a good, decent guy, you know? So it, it, it helps for both to literally be like Christ as opposed to the bible says but actually model our lives after who jesus is who he taught us he was and we live we have christ-centered marriages um as a result yeah 
And I know that there are a lot of people who have been, you know, listening to the podcast or reading the blog or reading your blog, um, and Gaina and which again is intentionally intentional, intentional today. Yes. There you go. It'll all be linked to the podcast notes. <laughs> yes. And you know, you're wanting to have these conversations with your spouse, or maybe you guys are starting to kind of see like things are like, we're okay, but we're not okay being like this in 10 years. So how do we get onto a better path? And mm-hmm. honestly, like the fixer for you book is fun for that. It's just, yeah. it's, it's a little bit like it's hard to have these like deep theological conversations about what do we believe about, you know, gender and God and marriage and these really heavy things that literal tomes have been written on. Yes. And, and if you're looking for an easy way to talk about it so that your marriage can start to have that change, you know, or maybe it's you and your friend group, or maybe it's you Even and your small group. Yeah. There's just like one little section in each of the fixer fuse where like you might want to do it at home with your spouse instead of in the group, but mm-hmm. that'll work great. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, this is just such a great opportunity for, like what Ngina was saying, when you have the good-hearted, good-willed spouses, when they see the truth, they start walking in that direction. You mm-hmm. don't automatically teleport to the end of the line, mm-hmm. like one second, but you start walking in the right direction. Yeah. And so the Fix It For You book can really just help you get those conversations started so mm-hmm. that you can start walking in the right direction together. And frankly, if they aren't willing to, that also mm-hmm. becomes a little bit more clear. Yeah. And what I really appreciate too about Ingina, because I think we're really similar, you know, we're, we're in lots of groups outside of this with abuse advocates and everything. And, and I love them. I really, I love them. Yes. To but I think mm-hmm. you and I are similar in the sense that we've got good marriages. Yeah. The reason yeah. we pivoted was not because we were in abusive situations or because our mm-hmm. husbands were awful. No. It was because we knew that this isn't God. And even that view of marriage, it wasn't, it wasn't just hurting my marriage or keeping my marriage from being everything it could be. It was actually hurting my view of God. Mm-hmm. And, and that really affected me, you know, in the thought that God doesn't love me as much as he loves my husband, or God is angrier at me than he is at my husband. Or he doesn't trust you. Or he much. doesn't trust me as much as he trusts doesn't my husband. You as competent. And that, that was really tough. And I went through a lot of this when I was younger and processed this when I was younger, but it isn't only about our marriages. It's about the whole picture. And, and often marriage is one of those felt need areas where, where it's easiest to switch because marriage is so personal and so emotional. Mm -hmm. And so this is often where I think God gets us (laughs) is when we're talking about marriage, but it affects everything, you know, it affects how you see God. And, and when you just get that breakthrough and you see, it doesn't need to be this way. Um, and, and understand what it means, like the Emmanuel, God with us to understand what it means to live that out. It's, it really is life-changing. And, uh, and I, so, I so appreciate that about you too, because you went in this whole, whatever the word is, whole hog, whole hog, (laughs) terrible expression, (laughs) terrible expression, (laughs) I jumped in bone feet first, that one's got us, (laughs) you know, even though it wasn't about you being abused. It's like, no, Mm -hmm. if someone else is being hurt, this matters. Yes. This matters. Even if, and, and that's what keeps me up at night is like, people are being hurt by this and how can the powers that be not see it? Well, and it's what Paul himself talks about in first Corinthians, right? If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am but a clanging gong uh, of clanging gone or a clashing symbol. Yeah. You know, if I have faith that can move mountains and if I have wisdom that can understand all prophecies or something like that, but I have not love, I am nothing. And I have nothing like just read first Corinthians 13, one through three at some point. Yeah. We only, we still, we always quote starting at verse four, but those first three verses, there's a reason we don't quote the first three verses. (laughs) And then we call out a lot of authors, a lot of pastors and a lot of theologians. Okay. There is a reason yeah. they skip those first three verses. Mm-hmm. God yeah. doesn't care if we have nice words, if we don't love people. Yeah. That's throughout scripture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm just so mm-hmm. grateful that there are so many people who are modeling what it looks like to care about people, even at personal cost, even yeah. at cost of personal pain and inconvenience. And so, yeah, from all of us, of course, as always, we love to hype you up and Gina, thank you. <laughs> for being oh, here. thank you. <laughs> Such a source of encouragement thank for you. so yeah. many. We really do appreciate having you on and Gina. And again, why don't you just tell people where they can find you? Yeah. So I also have so much fun hanging out with you guys. You guys are such, you're such fun and such a source of encouragement for me. Um, So you can find me at intentionaltoday.com. That's my website. 
or you can find me on Facebook, Intentional Today. Again, that's where I am. And on Instagram, I am Gena Otiende. That's N-G-I-N-A-O-T-I-E-N-D-E. -E. Mm -hmm. And Pinterest and Twitter, but those are my two main ones, Instagram yeah. and Facebook and the website. Right. And those will all be in the podcast notes as yes. well, so you can find yes. her. So thank you very much. I, I, I am sending you a copy of the Fixed It For You book. I hope you love it. Oh, <laughs> you're sending it? Oh, man. Yes. yes. So you can see. I'll, 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 yes. I'll even give you an early copy so you can see it. So anyway. <laughs> but oh, thank you for joining I will us. love it. All mm -hmm. right. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. <laughs> I genuinely just love Angina so much. I do too. <laughs> That's one of the best parts about doing this is we get to meet all these cool people. Well, and also like when we're done recording, we often just keep talking too. And we, Angina is just one of those people where whenever we end up chatting, we end up chatting for like double the time. Yeah. Because, hey, it's just, it's just wonderful. But something that I just talking about everything that's everything we've been talking about today, what it really just comes down to in my mind is this idea of being a Christian means we're supposed to care. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to care about more than whether or not we can just proof text our way to the point that we want to make. Yeah. We're supposed to care about people. We're supposed to care how it affects people. And we're supposed to care about looking like Christ, even mm -hmm. if that means some big, important changes in our own lives. Yeah. And I know that can be something that's hard to do. And so, yeah, yeah. please, the Fix It For You book really can help get those conversations started so you can figure out, you know, what weird misconceptions are you still holding on to? Mm -hmm. You know, what kinds of biases maybe do we have that we need to challenge or what kinds of patterns are happening in your relationship or, mm -hmm. you know, even among your friend group, like, hey, do we kind of believe some of this toxic stuff or, oh my goodness, we haven't ever thought about this, but yeah, we were totally saying this. I, 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 the conversations would just be so interesting. Mm -hmm. That could come out of this. So I know the conversations that we had as I was helping you edit it were interesting. Oh, absolutely. I'm trying to come up with the questions. And just to give you an example before we go of what some of those fixed it for you's are, I want to read to you one of the original quotes. Okay. And then one of our fixed quotes. Are you ready? So this comes from Ligon Duncan's Instagram reel mm -hmm. and the Gospel Coalition. And he says this, I think when a man knows that his wife trusts him and respects him, he's more apt to take some of the risks that are involved in spiritual leadership, like being the main person getting everybody to church on Sunday, <laughs> praying and reading the scriptures, <laughs> and thinking about life from a biblical perspective. And I'm just like, those are risky? Mm -hmm. Then being a mom must be like being Tom Cruise in some Mission Impossible right. movie. Like, so we that's... changed it. We fixed it for you. And it looks like this. I think when a man acts in such a way that his wife trusts and respects him and realizes he doesn't need her to coddle him so that he'll do basic Christian things like getting everybody to church on Sunday, praying and reading the scriptures, thinking about life from a biblical perspective, then they'll have a great life yeah. following Jesus together. Exactly. <laughs> it's like put the emphasis in the right place. And then we have um, six questions that you can use for discussion. And we have... Um, we have an explanation of how you can recognize red flags like this. And yeah, like what things to look for when it's not just this quote, but other things in kind of, quote unquote, the real world. Mm hmm. And if you want more examples of figs or fuse, frankly, just go to the just, just go, go to Instagram. Instagram and scroll through. There's so yeah. many there and they're so fun. And it's been so fun to really build community around them because people get excited about them. I yes. think when you see it visually, it's like, oh, I get it. Because so many people were telling us, Becca, that reading The Great Sex Rescue helped teach them what was healthy, mm -hmm. but they still didn't know mm -hmm. how to identify the unhealthy stuff. Like they would hear people saying something and it wouldn't sound quite right, mm -hmm. but they couldn't put their finger on what was wrong. And these fixed it for you. That's why we're doing this is to help people level up their discernment exactly <laughs> so they can figure out what's wrong and why this doesn't sound right and how we can reorient it back to jesus so please check out that book it's on sale for just 4.99 in the ebook version it's less than five bucks i mean a penny less than five bucks yeah but in america canada doesn't even have a penny <laughs> exactly i was like in canada unfortunately you would be rounded up to five dollars paying cash because you don't have pennies anymore <laughs> but but it is 4.99 an ebook um yeah. just for this launch week so please check it out it'll be going up to 6.99 after launch week but get it now well it's still cheap and it'll just be a great discussion starter. Do one each night with your husband. So thank you for joining us on this Bear Marriage Podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. And for everyone, happy Valentine's Day. And we will see you again on the 16th after Valentine's Day. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye. -bye.